national income and its composition. One of the pioneers of the subject we call economics today, Adam Smith, named his most influential work an inquiry into the nature and cause of the wealth of nations. What generates the economic wealth of a nation? What makes countries rich or poor? These are some of the central questions of economics. It is not that countries which are endowed with a bounty of natural wealth, minerals or forests or the most fertile lands are naturally the richest countries. In fact, resource-rich Africa and Latin America are some of the poorest countries in the world, whereas many prosperous countries have scarcely any natural wealth. There was a time when possession of natural resources was the most important consideration, but even then, the resource had to be transformed through a production process. The economic wealth or well-being of a country, thus, does not necessarily depend on the mere possession of resources. The point is how these resources are used in generating a flow of production and how, as a consequence, income and wealth are generated from that process. Let us now explore the term, composition of national income. To understand it in a better way, it is necessary for us to delve deeper into various terms associated with it. Flow of production. How does this flow of production arise? People combine their energies with natural and man-made environment within a certain social and technological structure to generate a flow of production. National income. In our modern economic setting, this flow of production arises out of production of commodities, goods and services by millions of enterprises, large and small. These enterprises range from giant corporations employing a large number of people to single entrepreneur enterprises. But what happens to these commodities after being produced? Each producer of commodities intends to sell her output. So, from the smallest items like pins or buttons to the largest ones like aeroplanes, automobiles, giant machinery or any saleable service like that of the doctor, the lawyer or the financial consultant, the goods and services produced are to be sold to the consumers. The consumer may in turn be an individual or an enterprise and the good or service purchased by that entity might be for final use or for use in further production. When it is used in further production, it often loses its characteristic as that specific good and is transformed through a productive process into another good. Thus, a farmer producing cotton sells it to a spinning mill where the raw cotton undergoes transformation into yarn. The yarn is in turn sold to a textile mill where through the productive process it is transformed into cloth. The cloth is in turn transformed through another productive process into an article of clothing which is then ready to be sold finally to the consumers for final use. Such an item that is meant for final use and will not pass through any more stages of production or transformations is called a final good. Why do we call this a final good? Because once it has been sold, it passes out of the active economic flow. It will not undergo any further transformation at the hands of any producer. It may, however, undergo transformation by the action of the ultimate purchaser. In fact, many such final goods are transformed during their consumption. For example, the tea leaves purchased by the consumer are not consumed in that form. They are used to make drinkable tea, which is consumed. Similarly, most of the items that enter our kitchen 
are transformed through the process of cooking. But cooking at home is not an economic activity, even though the product involved undergoes transformation. Home cooked food is not sold to the market. However, if the same cooking or tea brewing was done in a restaurant where the cooked product would be sold to customers, then the same items such as tea leaves would cease to be final goods and would be counted as inputs to which economic value addition can take place. Thus, it is not in the nature of the good, but in the economic nature of its use that a good becomes a final good. Consumption Goods and Capital Goods Of the final goods, we can distinguish between consumption goods and capital goods. Goods like food, clothing and services like recreation that are consumed when purchased by the ultimate consumers are called consumption goods or consumer goods. This also includes services which are consumed but for convenience we may refer to them as consumer goods. There are other goods that are of durable character which are used in the production process. These are tools, implements and machines. While they make production of other commodities feasible, they themselves do not get transformed in the production process. They are also final goods, yet they are not final goods to be ultimately consumed. Unlike the final goods, capital goods are the crucial backbone of any production process in aiding and enabling the production to take place. These goods form a part of capital, one of the crucial factors of production in which a productive enterprise has invested and they continue to enable the production process to go on for continuous cycles of production. These are capital goods and they gradually undergo wear and tear and thus are repaired or gradually replaced over time. The stock of capital that an economy possesses is thus preserved, maintained and renewed partially or wholly over time. It should be noted that some commodities like television sets, automobiles or home computers although they are for ultimate consumption, have one characteristic in common with capital goods. They are also durable, that is, they are not extinguished by immediate or even short period consumption. They have a relatively long life as compared to articles such as food or even clothing. They also undergo wear and tear with gradual use and often need repairs and replacements of parts, that is, like machines. They also need to be preserved, maintained and renewed. That is why we call these goods consumer durables. Thus, if we consider all the final goods and services produced in an economy in a given period of time, they are either in the form of consumption goods, both durable and non-durable, or capital goods. As final goods, they do not undergo any further transformation in the economic process. Of the total production taking place in the economy, a large number of products do not end up in final consumption and are not capital goods either. Such goods may be used by other producers as material inputs. Examples are steel sheets used for making automobiles and copper used for making utensils. These are intermediate goods, mostly used as raw material or inputs for production of other commodities. These are not final goods. Intermediate goods Intermediate goods are crucial inputs to any production process and a significant part of our manpower and capital stock are engaged in production of these goods. However, since we are dealing with value of output, we should realize that the value of the final goods already includes the value of the intermediate goods that have entered into their production as inputs. Counting them separately will lead to the error of double counting. Whereas, considering intermediate goods may give a fuller description of total economic activity, 
counting them will highly exaggerate the final value of our economic activity. Stocks Stocks are defined at a particular point of time. Income or output or profits are concepts that make sense only when a time period is specified. These are called flows because they occur in a period of time. The difference between stock variables and flow variables. Let's take an example. A tank is being filled with water coming from a tap. The amount of water which is flowing into the tank from the tap per minute is a flow. But the quantity of water in the tank at a particular point of time is a stock concept. Gross investment To measure the final output, the part of our final output that comprises of capital goods constitutes gross investment of an economy. These may be machines, tools and implements, buildings, office spaces, storehouses or infrastructure like roads, bridges, airports or jetties. But all the capital goods produced in a year do not constitute an addition to the capital stock already existing. A significant part of current output of capital goods goes in maintaining or replacing part of the existing stock of capital goods. This is because the already existing capital stock suffers wear and tear and needs maintenance and replacement. A part of the capital goods produced this year goes for replacement of existing capital goods and is not an addition to the stock of capital goods already existing and its value needs to be subtracted from gross investment for arriving at the measure of net investment. This deletion which is made from the value of gross investment in order to accommodate regular wear and tear of capital is called depreciation. Depreciation Let us consider a new machine that a firm invests in. This machine may be in service for the next 20 years after which it falls into disrepair and needs to be replaced. We can now imagine as if the machine is being gradually used up in each year's production process and each year one twentieth of its original value is getting depreciated. So, instead of considering a bulk investment for replacement after 20 years, we consider an annual depreciation cost every year. This is the usual sense in which the term depreciation is used and inherent in its conception is the expected life of a particular capital good, like 20 years in our example of the machine. Depreciation is thus an annual allowance for wear and tear of a capital good. In other words, it is the cost of the good divided by the number of years of its useful life. We are making a rather simple assumption here that there is a constant rate of depreciation based on the original value of the asset. There can be other methods to calculate depreciation in actual practice. Thus, in a nutshell, we can say that the social act of consumption and production are intricately linked and in fact, there is a circular causation here. The process of production in an economy generates factor payments for those involved in production and generates goods and services as the outcome of the production process. The incomes so generated create the capacity to purchase the final consumption goods and thus enable their sale by the business enterprises. The basic object of their production The capital goods which are also generated in the production process also enable the producers to earn income, wages, profits, etc. in a similar manner. The capital goods add to or maintain the capital stock of an economy and thus make production of other commodities possible.